Alright guys, here we are with some kind of stuff, STS number one. Uh, this is something a little bit different from what I usually do, but this is something I just can't help showing off. Uh, obviously, you are looking at the space shuttle. Uh, this is the best recreation I have ever made up to this point, and it flies like a beauty, just as you're about to see, and I, I am so excited to be sharing this. I mean, oh, it, it's just such a great craft. Not only is it functional, but it looks the part, and it's beautiful. I love it. I, I really can't hype around about this enough. Uh, but anyway, we're about to get on with this launch here. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to be getting into what I think about the shuttle program a little bit later on in the video. Uh, you know, that's always a hot topic. Uh, when it comes to NASA and all that stuff, and I'll get into my personal opinions on that a little bit later when we come in for re-entry. Uh, but right now, you're just seeing we're getting started here. Uh, basically, how this thing flies, I don't use MechJeb for actual autopilot uh, because it doesn't work. The way the MechJeb autopilot works, it, it can't handle this craft. And it just doesn't fly it properly. Um, so instead, I just use it for the gravity turn guidance, and basically how I set I set it to the uh, vehicle to follow that target reticle, reticle all the way up into orbit, and that's how I fly it. Uh, so it's like semi-manual, semi-autopilot. Uh, but anyway, we just lift it off of there. Uh, my gravity turns a little steep, even compared to the real shuttle. Uh, that's mostly on purpose. Uh, but you just saw there, it just rolled. I I am so happy I was able to figure that out. Uh, now with this, it's a little wobbly on this launch, because I'm not really lifting anything with this other than the orbiter itself. Um, so it's a little bit wobbly. When I have an actual payload in there, upwards of at least 10 tons, that weighs down the orbiter a little bit more, and it bounces the uh, whole stack, so it actually rolls very smoothly. Uh, but even then, I mean, I, I barely have to do anything to roll it, uh, even in this configuration, and, and it, it just still rolls. And that, that is awesome. There, I have yet to really see anybody do that that smoothly, at least recently anyway. I, I remember watching a video from way back um, when the CSS space shuttle, the uh, replica one that was out still, when that one was only just coming out. I remember seeing it in one of those videos, uh, but that was ages ago. Like yeah, That was like prior to me even coming into Kerbal Space Program. Uh, but anyway, we're rocketing it up into orbit here. Um, as you may have noticed, this uh, particular mission is um, under fuel in its fuel tank. Uh, that's because I was mostly replicating STS number one, uh, which really didn't have anything in its payload bay other than some scientific instruments. Uh, basically just to measure what was not only being um, uh, released by the orbiter itself, but also what was coming into contact with it. Uh, and I put something in there. You, you'll see a little bit later on. Mostly just random crap just to make it look right. I didn't really feel like trying to emulate the actual article. Uh, but yeah, it's going. Yeah, it's a little wobbly. Uh, like I said, there's really nothing in the payload base, so it's really light and off balance compared to when it would actually have a payload. Uh, so that's why it's a little bit wobbly. Uh, but we're coming up on SRB SEP. Uh, now, as you may have noticed with my Ice Turn Skyward videos, I have a pretty OCD level attention of detail. And I pretty much put that all into this craft right here. And as you're about to see with the SRB SEP, I made sure that it actually works exactly like it would in real life. It's going to look like it does in real life. Uh, well, mostly. On this launch, again, because we're not launching anything, it's different. I actually jettisoned the SRBs before they burn out, uh, which didn't really happen on the shuttle, at least not to the degree I'm doing and there they go. Yeah, see, look at that. That's pretty. I love that. Um, but basically, the reason why I had to do that is because I just, but it, basically in my test flights for this, when I don't have a payload in the bay, it, if I would have waited until they burned out, it would have either pushed me way beyond my target orbit, or they would have um, unbalanced the craft so much that it would have just wigged out and exploded. Uh, so I didn't want to do that, so that's why I jettisoned them 
right around, uh, I believe it was like a thousand meters a second or something like that. Uh, but I just around there, it works. The rest of the stack will go right up in the orbit. Yeah, it's going. Uh, I, I, I just, uh, just think it flies so beautifully. But um, another thing you're going to see that's different from how it was done in real life is with the ET separation, the external tank there. Um, the, with the way it works in real life, it doesn't use those things right there. The um, uh, jettison motors, it doesn't use anything like that. Uh, if you would, it would have damaged the orbiter too much. And ultimately, it didn't need it. Uh, in real life, it jettisoned a little bit with, from the back end there. And then what the orbiter would do at the same time, it would use its reaction control system to push it down and away from the external tank. And that's how they would separate. Uh, now in Kerbal, I, I just, I've tried replicating it and it just doesn't work. Uh, something about the external tank is, once I jettison it, it jettisons and it moves, uh, but then part of it slams back into the orbiter, and until the orbiter starts, like, really, really moving, it's like it's glued to it, and I just couldn't get it to come off, especially not with the RCS system. Um, so that's why I just added the jettison motors on there to just make it go away. Uh, I just could not deal with it. Alright, now on this launch... Uh, again, because we don't have a payload, this launch is a little bit different from how it would actually be. And indeed how it would actually be if I was playing it with a payload. Um, instead, basically at this point when I'm coming up to circularize, yes I'm saying it right now, to circularize the orbit, um, we're using pretty much all of the fuel that we do have in the orbiter except for a very small amount uh, to circularize, which... It isn't necessarily done on the shuttle, or the real shuttle, rather. Uh, instead, the ET would still be attached at this point, and the SSMEs would be used to circularize for the most of the orbit. And then the um, OMS would be used for the last part to finish that up. Uh, but here in this case, I um, just couldn't do it. Uh, so that's why we're doing it this way. And it gets a little bit long. Uh, so here in about a couple of seconds, it's going to start speeding through all this crap. And yeah. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful craft. And, it, and actually in orbit, it does fly beautifully as well. Um, you're not going to see any of it in here, but I have tested it in orbit um, to see how well it will maneuver, put itself in place. Uh, I've, I've done docking with it. It, it. I've done a number of things. Uh, but yeah, in orbit, it works perfectly, exactly as advertised. All right, yep, we're speeding up here. All right, actually, we let you just uh, circularize the orbit, and we're about to open the payload bay. We're just getting the orbiter situated uh, for warping. Uh, now, basically, what I'm doing with the way the angles the angles are in real life, the Earth is big. Uh, so, you know, when it's at actually following the horizon as the shuttle would most of the time, you would be able to see the Earth outside those front windows. Uh, but in Kerbal, the planet is scaled down, so you can't. Uh, so to get that nice look, I angle the orbiter a little bit, so that way I can see the Earth outside the window. Uh, but I just opened the payload bay, and yeah, there's my little fake science thing. I just kind of put it in there just to have something in the orbiter for this particular video. Uh, but yeah, it, it's up there and it's good to go. I'm just going to let you guys watch this for a little bit. Um, but now, now that we're here, just going back to the shuttle program in of itself, um, you know, uh, obviously there there's a lot of opinions on it. Uh, some people think it was fantastic, you know, we should be get, building another space shuttle, one that's better, safer, blah, blah, blah. And of course I could see why. You know, the space shuttle, even in its earliest days when the real SDS-1 was launched, it was such a cool spacecraft, and the way it was um, talked about by literally everyone, it was just so cool, and, and it, it's incredible, and um, it, you know, it's understandable why you'd want to do that. And of course, you have the other side of the fence there that thinks that the space shuttle was a dangerous, 
overblown, overhyped machine that should never have been built or flown, at least the way it was built and flown. Uh, and of course, that has merit as well. Uh, a lot of the problems with the space shuttle had a lot to do with the fact that the DoD uh, subsidized much of its development, and as a result, they actually made the decision to um, increase the uh, dimensions of the payload bay, wing size, all this stuff, and ultimately, um, after Challenger, uh, after that disaster happened, like, the, what was it, four or five years into the program, at that point, the DoD decided they want nothing to do with the shuttle. They're just going to go back to expendable rockets. Um, so, you know, now NASA is stuck with this big old shuttle that they can't really use for much of what it was designed for. And because it's not going to be launched anywhere near as much without it, it they, they just can't do much with it. And that's why the cost started snowballing on all of the, the entire program. Because um, not only was the entire system just overcomplicated for what it was being used for, but the fact that it wasn't flying as much meant that for every launch you're spending all this time and money refurbishing these orbiters, getting the SRBs ready again, making a new external tank, uh, just for a couple of launches a year. And it, it just doesn't work out. The economics of scale, it, it's just terrible. And, that, and that's why towards the end of the program we saw launches that were like a billion dollars a launch. And, and that's insane. Especially when most of these launches were just taking things up to the space station or delivering a tiny little satellite or something. Uh, that, that's ridiculous. And, of course, uh, that makes sense, too. Um, now, my opinion on the shuttle is mixed. Um, you know, when I was younger and I could have seen the shuttle, I didn't really care as much about it as I probably should have. Uh, mostly because the shuttle, it's... Something about it, to me, growing up, just didn't seem right, or at least didn't seem cool enough. And... Basically, that's mostly because I never got to actually see the thing up close up until I'm in my late 20s, and I finally get to go see Atlantis in person. And that, that's when I actually fell in love with the shuttle as a whole. Uh, when I actually saw the thing in person and saw what it was, and then started to comprehend what it could do, that that is... Oh. If you ever in Florida and you ever get the chance to go to the visitor center... You have to see Atlantis, and more importantly, you have to go see the Apollo Set and Five Center too. You have to go see everything there. It, it's amazing. Um, but, but anyway, basically with the shuttle, I love it from an engineering and pilot standpoint. Um, obviously, I like to tinker with things, so if the engineer part of me really enjoys the shuttle, and as you can see with this, I really enjoyed putting this baby together. And you know, that, that took a lot of. Um, engineering a lot of um, experience with playing this game and building with this game as well as some other things and of course the pilot part of me really likes it as well uh, just because it's fun to fly and even the real shuttle is really fun to fly if you ever get to play a uh, more direct simulator of it. it it is so much fun and i just enjoy the heck out of it um but yeah that, that that's basically that and then of course the um space nerd part of me uh really likes the shuttle just because it's so cool and you know i really wish that you know something could have happened in our timeline where shuttle 2 could have gotten developed or something along those lines so that way we could have a shuttle but then have the best of the other side of the coin you know safety uh you know does something more than just putting satellites and space station parts up in orbit um yeah, stuff like that. Uh, but anyway, we're coming up on re-entry. Now, this is the other major departure from how the real shuttle operated. Uh, if the real shuttle re-entered like this ballistically, that shuttle would explode immediately as soon as it got around to this point. Um, the reason being is that my shuttle is taking all that heat of re-entry directly in the face. And it's not supposed to do that. The uh, black underside of the TPS system... That, that's what's meant to protect the orbiter from the heat. Um, so in reality, if I was trying to be realistic, uh, this orbiter had to be tilted up by about 30 to 40 degrees, and that, that's how the orbiter would be protected on re-entry. Um, however, in Kerbal Space Program, 
this is almost impossible to replicate. Uh, not only consistently, but also in a way that makes it fun to do. Um, because because not only does it have to be tilted up at a really high angle of attack to protect itself, in order to slow down, the real orbiter had to bank as well. Uh, so not only would it be tilted up by 40 degrees, it would also be banking by about 80 degrees to the left or right to make the S-turns in order to slow down. Um, and that, of course, is also really, really hard to do in Kerbal. I've tried it. I've tried it a million times at different angles, like scaling down the angles. It doesn't work, and it doesn't look great. And ultimately, most of the time, the orbiter breaks up anyway. So I just gave up on that. Instead, I ran it like this. Uh, so basically, we just follow a ballistic trajectory. Um, typically, I set my um, uh, ballistic landing site uh, usually to be somewhere out in the Gulf or somewhere over um, uh, it's either Louisiana or Arkansas. I can't tell from the uh, height we're at. Uh, but essentially, we set it there. We just follow that prograde trajectory all the way in until we get about to this point. And at this point, I deploy my air brakes, pull up, and that's how we get into a level flight. And now, of course, Kerbals are taking like 3 to 4 Gs at this point. Which, I mean, they could take it. They're Kerbals. But it's not a realistic way to do that. And it's not a very comfortable way to fly. More importantly, than the real shuttle, the wings would probably shear off even if it, it, even if it could do this. Um, but essentially, yeah, that's how I re-enter. And it's fine. It works. And ultimately, it makes, the, it, makes it actually fun to fly this thing. Um, now, another part of the shuttle I was able to replicate is the huge glide time. And actually, on my shuttle, I think I may have put a little bit too much into it. I may have over-designed it, uh, which is fine. The um, I've actually been able to shorten the wings over time. Because with this, when I was designing it, uh, there was about five or six different points in the craft's design where I thought it was finished. And, of course... It just kept going. I kept tweaking it. And this is pretty much the final, final design that I was happy with. Um, so, yeah, with this, the original wings, they were about, uh, I would say about about the size of a 1.25 meter tank uh, in length longer than the wings we have right now, um, which is obviously a lot. Uh, I was able to shorten them, uh, make them look a little bit better. And, yeah, it works out really well, and I was even able to replicate that little curved wing tip that the real orbiter had. And when I was able to do that, I was I was so giggly happy. I, I was so excited. Uh, because that's really, that's not something you see very often in planes with, especially with the B-9 procedural wings. Uh, because it all deals in right angles. Uh, so when I figured out how I could do that little curve right there, oh, I was so happy. Uh, but yeah, we're coming in for a landing here. Uh, basically, so you know what I'm doing, we're at about seven, uh, seven kilometers up. Uh, we're just flying. Uh, uh, we're just ma we're just maintaining altitude right now, and I actually just started the descent right there. Um, essentially, we're just trying to get to the landing site. Uh, as you may have noticed, it was a very cloudy day over the Florida area in the game when I did this. Uh, so I didn't really know where exactly it was. I couldn't see it. Um, so basically, I just maintained altitude and then started dropping until I could see it. And you'll see where I actually see it here in a little bit. Um, yeah, it was actually right about there when I start pitching down. And what I just did there is I actually turned off the pitch control on my outer elevons. Uh, the reason for that is is just for stability once we're coming in for a landing. Uh, because on launch, you want to have the elevons on the outside there. You want them to also control your pitch just because that gives you a lot more control. Uh, but on landing, you don't have this big external tank and these two huge boosters on the other sides um, to deal with. Uh, so with that, that's too much pitch control, at least for me anyway. Um, so I turn them off, and I just use the inboard elevons instead. And that gives me really good control of the orbiter, as you're going to see. Um, but yeah, basically now we're on final approach here. Um, so I can see it from here. Uh, it's in the other window. Yeah, there we go. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a pretty bumpy landing. I'm still practicing with this. Uh, but also because I... Um, 
for whatever reason, I decided to go really short and fast with this landing. Because uh, in reality, I should have what I should be doing right here, I should be turning out into the gulf and making a wider turn back to line up with the runway. Uh, that would have let me bleed off a lot more speed coming in. Uh, but more importantly, I wouldn't have had to um, be so drastic in my descent angles. Because uh, as you're seeing, I'm going almost to... Uh, looks like it was 15 degrees there at one point, and I'm going to do it again here shortly, I think, um, just to get it down to the right altitudes and where I need it to be. And I'm going to take a drink here, holy shit. <coughs> Alright, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I, I really need to learn to start taking a drink of water periodically or something. I'm not used to talking for this long. Uh, but yeah, it's coming in. We're turning in now. Uh, it, it's been... I love this thing. It's so much fun to fly. Uh, but yeah, basically we're just deploying the air brake, keeping it level at the 5 degree um, glide slope, all that good stuff. Uh, look at those wings. That That is just pretty. I, I, oh. <laughs> I love it. I love this thing. Yeah, and believe it or not, it, it does actually fly really well, all things considered. I mean, granted, that's probably because I over-designed the wings a little bit. Uh, but even so, I mean, they might be a little bit bigger compared to the fuselage than what they really should be. Uh, but at the same time, I was also going for looks and what looked right compared to actual pictures of the orbiter. Um, and of course, I've seen an orbiter in real life, um, so I have a general idea of you know the relative scale of things. And what I have here is more or less dead on. Um, it might be a little bit much for the scaled down world of Kerbal and the masses I'm dealing with, but at the same time, I want it to look right more than I want strict replication. Um, but yeah, we're about to come down on touchdown. And there it is. Yep, see, a little bumpy. I came in way too fast, see. At this point, what I should have done is I actually should have been um, sub 100 meters a second when I touched down. And I could have done that if I would have made that wide angle turn over the gulf. Uh, that, that's what I could have done, and that would have gotten me down a lot smoother. Uh, but more importantly, I also should have turned off SAS after I touched down, um, because once that parachute deployed, it my orbiter automatically tried pulling back up, and that's no bueno. Uh, but yeah, we are down on the ground and good to go. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'm going to be doing more videos on this orbiter and what I can do with it a little later. Uh, but I do have another Ice Turn Skyward video to do, so that's going to be coming first right after this.